a critical audience. And, and that's very important. And Goa has reached that critical point in many areas. I must say, I'm amazed at the, at the kind of, we have right now this literary festival going on, then there's a history, then you have this uh, festival of ideas in, I think, February, isn't it? Yeah. These are wonderful things, and Goa is really glow, growing in complexity. You wish, uh, ma'am, uh, your children come back and live in India? Yes. <laughs> well, I wish, but I suppose one doesn't have that much of a hold on them, you know. Yeah, we like that. Like they've gone off, you know, from, yeah, we, from the nest. Yeah, no. But uh, there is one thing when you talked about gas cylinders, you know. Yeah. Yes, a lot of uh, people feel they would return, like to return to India. Not so much for gas cylinders, but I think uh, for schools, because uh, um, India and especially Goa, I would think, doesn't have such a good school system. So they would rather stay, you know, in the US or UK uh, for schools. And then I think secretary also uh, for hospitals and medical insurance. I was just hearing from my friend uh, Rhoda, who's coming from London. And the health insurance there is just wonderful and fantastic. We don't have anything like that in India. Um, uh, education system. Again, at least in, when we were doing this plan, we found out that a lot of, uh, uh, in the village schools, a lot of girls at the age of 10 or 11 drop out, we were told, because there's no toilet facility for them in some of the schools. Now that's shocking, because we should have a huge percentage of people who are totally literate, like 100%, like they have in Kerala. And of course, uh, we should be a center of education for the country. I think we should have more than IITs, IIM schools of filmmaking. It should, when, when a young Indian wants to go to college anywhere in India, they must immediately think, should I go to Goa? Like the way Americans think, should I go to Boston? Should I go to Harvard, to MIT? Yeah. You know, the combination of a good school system and a good hospital system would make Goa a center for the best companies in, in, I think, in the world who could have their head offices. Right now they go to Singapore, to KL. Goa is a much finer place. There's a much better life for everybody. And, and uh, so it, it would change completely our economics. J just getting a good, and very good for the Goans too, forget about them. And the second thing is a good hospital system and combined with our existing hotels, would make medical tourism a reality and completely outclips mm. Malaysia and all. Mm -hmm. Because we've got so many doctors, nurses right here in Goa. This is, the, to me, the future of Goa, the best education and the best medical facilities in India. If we just do those two things, many, many things will follow, including jobs. And I stuff. believe, sir, uh, our first chief minister talked about uh, Babu Sahib Mandodkar. Yeah. He emphasized on two things when, when he started in 63, it was yeah. education and health. Of course, now we have to, we, we, maybe uh, after well, completing 50 years, we may have to review it. But as far as education is concerned, you, you, you were abroad. How do you differentiate between education there and education here? And how was your experience education about ex uh, education abroad? No, I, w I went abroad as a, as a college student. I, I, I didn't go as a, as a, yeah. as a school student. I, but I think even from this, from uh, certainly in college in America, students uh, are not spoon-fed. They have to do a lot of digging themselves. So you learn to be independent. Uh, you have many more classes which involve an exchange of opinions, what they call seminars, where mm. you, you have to prepare something and then discuss it and defend it, etc. Mm. I learned a lot in the process uh, because you have to think things out. But I think that even happens in their high schools. I don't know, I haven't experienced it. And I, so, so what's important basically is also self-learning. Self Consistent and continuous self-learning yeah. is, is important and not blind learning but completely innovative, yeah. more creative. Well, well the way they teach experimentations. In, yeah. The way they teach in America is the opposite and it has its disadvantages, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. I remember we heard a, a, a seminar at MIT. There was a very, we, it was on Michelangelo. And then we saw all his paintings and the Sistine Chapel, all in slides. And then four of us went to a drugstore across the road. And one of us, you're sitting there drinking this horrible drugstore coffee. And one of us said, you know, I don't think Michelangelo was so great. And I thought that's really terrific, four idiots sitting in a booth. <laughs> 
talking about, we don't even understand what he's about. So that's the other way of learning. You, you criticize before you've understood. Okay. I'm saying this because this is a modern way of teaching. And it has to be that because when we watch television, you have to ask yourself, including your program, <laughs> you have to ask yourself, why are they telling me this? Right. If you just swallow it all, you'll end up an absolute goon. Definitely. So you need both these things, I'm trying to say. On one side, you've got to trust the teacher. They don't trust the teacher enough in America, for my mind. On the other hand, you've got to at times ask yourself, why are they telling me this? We don't do enough of that in India, whether it's in discussions or politics. We don't ask, say, what is the motivation for this person to say this? I feel uh, education is both these things, I mean. Yeah. Mr. Charles Puraya is a goal, okay, yeah. and um, okay, his roots are here, very strong. Uh, but there were many Goans, even after conversions, they ran away to Mangalore. And uh, Mr. Charles Puraya got that Goan back, back to Goa <laughs> in the name of Monica Kuraya, uh, a Mangalorean, basically, basically a Goan. Uh, culturally, in what way? Uh, uh, you find Goa different? Okay. Yeah, I think the Every Goans day. are much more musical. I don't, there are very few Mangalorians who are musical. I see. Yeah, one of the things was that, that also besides eating beef, they were basically don't wear anything, don't, you know, uh, some wearing something and then even wearing frocks and all these things were there. The, the frocks were actually very much part of the European and the Portuguese culture. Yeah. So we never did. We always wore a sari. I see. Yeah. Still I don't skin. remember, a, the, maybe one or two Mangalorians who wore a frock and they were in Bombay. Oh. No one in Mangalore ever did. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, <laughs> you still remember, you, you, sp you spoke Kokani at home, there? No, I was always in Bombay. I was born and brought up okay. in Bombay. But you know but My parents were, you know, uh, educated in Mangalore. And uh, to them, uh, Kokani was very much a living language. My father spoke uh, and wrote and read Konkani. It was in the Kannada script, of course. Yeah. And uh, he's uh, well versed in Kannada. Uh, Konkani was very much a, a living language, and he read a lot in Konkani. And uh, he would always refer to Konkani proverbs, you know, and. Uh, I see. Uh, and he said, you know, Konkani is a very expressive language. Mm. Uh, the uh, proverbs were also, you know, I mean, full of imagery. Uh, might be crude at some, you know, sometimes. But uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, I mean, it wasn't crude, but a uh, proverb uh, that uh, if someone got angry, you know, I think for a little, very small reason, they'd say, Naka wai mus boslo. Yeah. So I think there must have been a lot of flies around Charles. <laughs> Does, uh, uh, but uh, no, there were lots of others. In this. Anyway, that's that. And um, but the vocabulary stayed, you know. And uh, so even today, I mean, here in Goa, I manage quite well. It's not very correct, but fluent. Okay, you understand. Goa I understand. Oh, that's great. Uh, Ma'am, something more about you, which I particularly, when I saw it, I was quite mesmerized. Um, that you, you are a graduate and everything, and then you suddenly decided to become a weaver. <laughs> <laughs> yes, from microbiology to weaving, that's yeah. the only way. Yeah. What, 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 what made you a viewer, or what was that passion for you to become uh, a viewer? Well, I was always interested in saris and textiles. And I think it's India's greatest asset, you know, the textile. And uh, I'd already sort of, you know, seen some beautiful uh, saris come out of the temples. And I started a collection uh, even before, I mean, I met Charles. And then after we were married, uh, uh, Charles was invited to teach at MIT. And because I'd never been abroad, we started our visiting, you know, a lot of cities around. So we stopped in Helsinki. And we met uh, with some very fine weavers there. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by those rugs. You know, they're a very heavy pile rug uh, called Rhea rugs. And so when we got to America, I asked whether I could take a course 
in, uh, in weaving. But that was a little too specialized, you know, for, for those four months that I was going to be there. And, but one day, uh, Professor Kepesh, whom Charles has talking, uh, spoken about earlier, uh, he phoned me and said, uh, a very good friend of his from, I mean, who was Finnish American, was over and would I come over right away? So I got there and uh, she, of course, was wonderful and she said, come over to my place in, Cran in uh, Connecticut and I'll teach you how to weave. And I went there a couple of times and she gave me her uh, loom the design of a loom. And so when I came back to India, I set it up, I had it work. And then I was lucky enough to go down to the government weaver service center. And I did a course for about four or five months. Ooh. And then I explained... You're like, what age? Oh, I was, I was 23, I think. That's it. And uh, then I started experimenting on my own. And, uh, so. How does an architect look at these weeks? Look at the weaving. Sticks of water. I think, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I learned a lot in a way. I mean, I think uh, I was always interested in color, but architects use, we use colors, you know, because we used to use primary colors and stuff. But, uh, <clears throat> of course, the color range is much, much richer. And in fabric, it's incredibly subtle. And so I think it, it loosens you up and you, it's easier for you to use colors. But also you recognize that in weaving, there is a structure. Stru There's a structure of the weft. And you yeah. should explain that, Monica, what that is. In a loom, you have a, a warp and a weft. And then you have a reed which keeps all the threads very regular and fixed. And I found that uh, if I you know, wrap the warp without using the reed, I would get a very sort of ambivalent kind of effect. So I thought it would be wonderful if I could start, you know, with a very fixed Make structure and then, you know, pull the reed off and then get the threads to meander around. Oh, we should go back. So more than weaving, it looks like painting. <laughs> they look like paintings also. But I heard that a lot of your, basically they are wall hangings and a lot of your wall hangings are um, all over the world. Where is it? Not it all so over many the people, world. So, so many places I heard. But I have four pieces uh, that were commissioned by Philip Johnson for the Four Seasons restaurant in New York. And then I was asked to do a piece for the Constitution yeah, Court of South one. Africa. And, uh, and that's the banyan tree, uh, which is the logo of the, uh, of the Constitutional Court. And then it's black and white. And uh, Actually, they, they commissioned me to do it, but I was so moved by, you know, uh, meeting people like Albie Sachs and all this, that I decided to give it to them as a gift. Because, as, as I said, uh, it was the banyan tree, which was their logo. It was black and white, pretty much Africa. It was weaving and the hand loom, which was, you know, in a way, it harked back to... I also Dandy. heard that in Supreme Court, uh, uh, a judge also has, has, has a wall, you know, wall and something. No, that's in the Constitution. That's in the Constitution. In the Constitution. I see, I see. I think that, that needs a big applause, because, because what we learned from India is, is everywhere in South Africa and all the yeah, uh, sir, you were telling me some nice incident about uh, she was invited uh, and yeah. we had gone with her. Oh, God. Yeah, my gosh, that's... It's taking us it's back a long story. so many years. Uh, yes. No, um, usually when we travel, in, you know, in those days you couldn't travel, you got $20 when you left the country. Unless you were rich and you were a businessman, you couldn't travel. But if you were lucky, you were invited somewhere to to give a talk or to teach and, and so we would all go off and I would exchange my ticket and sometimes we even took the children, we'd go at the back of the plane. And uh, once Monica was asked by this bank in America somewhere to uh, do a huge piece, the biggest piece she had ever done. And uh, this, they sent a ticket for her for the opening and uh, <laughs> it happened that we were in London with our two children and gone for an Aga Khan meeting. And, uh, so this, we didn't know how, Monica couldn't go alone all the way beyond Chicago and I couldn't go with her and leave the two children behind and should she send only whatever. So, and this friend of ours, she <laughs> said, it's Monica's trip and you just don't want to go. So I had to go, I mean, I had no choice. And I went. 